Mark, I'll start recording. Recording in progress. Okay, uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, members of the public, members of the panel. My name is Mark Zuroff. I am sitting as chair of this meeting concerning 108 Center Street in Brookline. Uh, before we begin, I will confirm that all members and other persons anticipated to participate on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Uh, we have Jesse Geller. Present. And Randolph Mecklejohn. Present. And from the town staff, we have Maria Morelli. Present. And uh, I remind everybody, I think that's all we have from staff. Uh, remind everybody else on the panel uh, to, uh, before you begin to speak, uh, that you identify yourself clearly. Um, so uh, the hearing, this hearing of the ZBA in open session is being conducted remotely and in a manner that is consistent with the legislature's extension of the provision initially made under Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 executive order concerning the now expired state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the, the pandemic. This body is authorized to meet entirely remotely so long as adequate public access is provided. Adequate public access does not include public participation unless such participation is required by law. This hearing will feature public comment. For this hearing, the ZBA is convening by video conference via Zoom is posted on the town's calendar, which identifies how the public may access the hearing. Be advised that this hearing is and that some attendees may be participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that others may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All supporting materials that have been provided to members of this body are also available to the public and may be accessed through the town website or by request from planning staff. Finally, before turning to the agenda, I will cover some ground rules that will permit clear and effective conduct of our business and help to ensure accurate hearing minutes. I, or Maria, will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, I will invite each member by name to provide any comment, question, or motion. Please hold yours until your name is called. Please also remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking and to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. Before responding, please wait until the floor is yielded to you and state your name before speaking. If the members of the board uh, wish to engage in sidebar comment with other members, please do so through Maria. Finally, each vote taken in this hearing will be conducted by roll call vote. For the public comment for a uh, component of this meeting, I will first ask members of the public if there are any who wish to speak to identify themselves by name and address only. I will call on each by name, or well, Maria will. Please enter your name into the chat section, which you will find the icon for at the bottom of your screen. Click on this icon and the chat window will appear on the right. Our host, Maria, will cue members in the order in which the request is received. Additionally, we will ask if members of the public who are calling in would like to speak in, well, actually we won't. Uh, that will be for a later time. Um, I do remind everyone that is attending this evening's hearing, including all of the um, applicant uh, staff members and so forth, that this meeting is uh, concerned primarily with traffic and uh, that we ask that the public can find uh, their comments if they wish to make any to the matter before the board this evening. There will be adequate uh, opportunities for the public to comment on other aspects of the project when we get to those aspects as we go through the uh, steps in uh, completing this series of uh, meetings. So that being said, I will turn the meeting over to Maria who will give us staff report and update on the status of the project from a staff point of view, Maria. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Maria Morelli, I'm a planner in the regulatory division of the Brookline Planning Department. Just quickly wanna go over the agenda. First, I will give a, a staff report and then we will turn it over to traffic peer review and parking peer review. And then the applicant has an opportunity to respond to the peer review. And of course the board uh, may have questions. 
there's also, we're making time on this agenda for the applicant's response to the ZBA charge. And what we mean by a ZBA charge is uh, when there was the uh, design peer review uh, provided by Cliff Bomer at the sep at September 20th hearing, the ZBA took note of changes that they'd like to see the applicant address or start working on, the, uh, and the applicant has an opportunity to respond to that charge with revised plans. So we are making time on that agenda to look at the applicant's response to the ZBA's charge regarding architecture design. Uh, there might be, um, there, there certainly will be public comment as the chair noted. Uh, and then before the, we continue the hearing, the ZBA might have further instruction for, uh, for the applicant. So in turning to the, the staff report, I just wanted to provide an overview of the schedule. The last hearing, of course, was September 20th. We focused on architecture peer review and there was initial instruction from the ZBA to the applicant. The original deadline to close this hearing was um, January 8th, 2022. And the, the former planning director did ask DHCD, the Department of Housing and Community Development, for some waivers from statutory deadlines. As you know, there's a 180 day deadline from the time a, a hearing is open to when we need to close the hearing unless we receive written extensions from the applicant. Um, so DHCD did provide a 60 day extension uh, to, to close the hearing. Uh, January, excuse me, February 27th, 2022. Now I always prepare an initial project schedule and that schedule that I have prepared uh, is predicated on a January close. I don't see any reason to change that schedule and I would like at some point to pull the ZBA for some other dates. We are confirmed for November 3rd, though the topic isn't defined just yet. And the other dates that I'm looking at are November 22nd, December 13th, and December 27th. Um, I'm also told that the applicant does have a, a January a deadline because of some state funding um, milestones. So I just wanted to, to note that. So in regard to the ZBA charge that was provided at the September um, hearing, it was confined to several categories, a lack of open space. So the, this particular um, parcel is actually, they're one of three contiguous parcels that are part of the Hebrew Senior Life Campus. There's 100 Center, this the subject site 108 Center, and then the third um, 112-120 Center Street. So therefore the, the ZBA did prefer that the applicant take an, a campus-wide approach regarding any functions or amenities like open space. If there wasn't going to be a campus-wide approach, then any functions and amenities to support the project's program should be maintained on the subject property. Uh, the ZBA also wanted to see evidence of choreography of all of the site functions, whether that's trash, access, drop-off, um, anything that would pertain to paths of movement so that we could understand access, any safety issues concerning pedestrians going from one site to another, any impacts on the uh, public way uh, concerning you know, coordinated trash, you know, how, what, what would the streetscape look like on trash day, for instance. The architectural style was another uh, uh, category. Uh, the relationship to 100 and 112 Center Street make much more sense than across the street, which is the smaller scale uh, residential Victorians. Uh, any setback and step backs of the upper floor, what we call articulation of the massing. And um, considering any compressions, like a taller building for instance, was one consideration that the ZB had put forth if that might affect the the footprint of the building and, and improve the, the setbacks. So we had, um, it's been a month and we've had working groups every week, uh, September 23rd, September 30th, uh, October 7th and October 14th, which was a really rigorous and ambitious um, uh, schedule for working groups. Normally we need like two weeks turnaround so this architecture team worked really long hours to have really productive working groups 
with Cliff Bomer, who is the ZBA's uh, design peer review. So just looking at, um, just taking it from the ground plane, what we mean is just what's happening on the site. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to begin with were just the positioning of, of the footprint. We looked at different schemes, whether it's reducing the driveway, um, compressing, reducing the, the surface area or the floor area of the ground floor, shifting the footprint north, um, seeing if there, if there were any setback improvements, um, if there could be any changes to you know, compression, expansion, and compression of upper floors. Um, we also looked at, spent a lot of time looking at the connections among the three parcels and what that meant in terms of safety. Um, pedestrian passageways, we wanted to see where there were, was going to be any porosity from uh, you know, the ground floor, from different, um, from different paths and, and walkways to the senior center, for instance, thinking that there's going to be community space uh, on that ground floor. What does that path look like? What is the invitation to you know, use different amenities and programming on the campus, on the campus itself, as well as any open, open space um, options and site circulation. We looked at possibly uh, reducing the number of curb cuts uh, uh, by one. Um, some of the other things that we looked at were um, certainly the open space and the vegetation trees that exist and uh, could be could be added. And so one thing that I would say that I was really pleased to see that the applicant was taking all of these suggestions really seriously and, and showing the thought process so that when the team was actually working on it just to consider, they would actually come back with evidence of, of how, they had, how they had tried it and what their reaction was and, and the pros and the cons and the disadvantages. So I said there wasn't a lot of movement in, so in, in one respect, it was disappointing that a lot of those bigger moves that had been proposed by Cliff um, you know, we're not, we're not actually incorporated in, in the revision. I think the biggest move was certainly the amount of the community space was reduced by 800 feet, which did, approve, which did improve the open space um, opening up at the, at the rear. The most significant and the most promising was really how the, the plan for the connection amongst the, the three parcels really is so is promising. And we actually do feel that there is even more opportunity to capitalize on that. Um, I think you'll see from the visuals which are in the presentation and not in the, the files or the, the plans that we provided um, that really show at the street level how that, um, that whole program really works so successfully. Um, the other thing that, um, we want to move on to is the architectural style, or maybe I'll just actually turn to massing before I, I turn to architectural style. The different schemes that uh, were examined were cutting back, keeping it seven stories, but articulating by, by losing units. And then there was another scheme where actually making the building taller could provide opportunity pro to provide more massing. And um, I think that I'll probably leave it up to Cliff to, to to have him explain what his reaction was. But all I will say is that it was a very rigorous process. The applicant what, took the process very seriously, was very respectful of the process, spent lots of hours providing visuals to show what those impacts could mean to a butters um, on all four sides and provided evidence of the, the site sections and shadow studies and perspectives and stills from the 3D model so that we could assess that. So it really wasn't about, we were proposing in words and, and they were responding in words. We were looking at the actual studies and the thought process and the decision-making process that the applicant provided. Um, it's no surprise because you have the revised plans that the applicant really feels strongly that keeping it a seven story building with no articulation is really what they can do considering um, the middle, minimal improvement 
on, on view sheds and shadows on the abutters. Um, the sustainability program is really important to this project. It is proposed to be passive house with solar. Um, so that is an important aspect. I'll leave it up to the applicant to talk about the other um, you know, pros and cons that, that they weighed. But in terms of you know, what is, is worth it, normally I don't really weigh in on these things, but I, I do have to say because it, it was something that Cliff really pushed hard for to consider an eight story building. So there could be some articulation by the fourth working group. I think that the feeling was, it's not something that we needed to push so hard on. The most important thing here is that there is a deep setback in the front yard that is in line with the other two buildings that does mitigate that height. And the other two buildings do have similar bulk. Uh, the open space and the, the ground plane and the access is something where we would like to see even more progress continue because it is so promising. And namely, and this is something that the applicant is, is going to look at, there is some, there are some parking spaces that straddle that property line. We don't know what could be done, but there is an opportunity to really think about what the options are to ensure that there's not only more visual space, but that there's a safer pr protected walkways, or if there's any, any activities outdoors, that there is a you know, decent separation from people who are going to be, you know, enjoying those activities and any cars that will be parking or using the driveway. Uh, the other aspect of the, uh, the, the charge related to the architectural style um, before it had been, uh, it was really like a, a Victorian motif, which wasn't working as a six story building. And I would say that the, the biggest changes is really in materials and the, and the color scheme. Normally we don't talk about the skin of the building because we don't consider that really to be an adequate substitute for like meaningful massing changes. But you know, our feeling here is that I think with you know, a simpler scheme that can actually, there is an opportunity I'll say to maybe just improve the texture um, on the facades, and and I think Cliff can maybe speak a little, can elaborate on that, as can the applicant's team, the project team, where there could, and what I mean by texture, there can be more opportunities to expand access to open space. So not all of it has to be at the ground plane. We certainly don't want to ignore a usable open space at the ground plane, but there are different, you know, opportunities to provide you know, quieter, you know, or maybe amenities for the, for units or on the, on the roof, you know, if that's, um, if that's possible, but there are opportunities to maybe to improve the texture and the patterning on the building. So that's, that's not a minor thing. It's not really um, considered a superficial thing, I think, for this, this project. Um, so those, I think, are like the, the biggest things. We, we still are working with the health department and DPW in regard to the trash plan because it is combining some efficiencies with the three with the three parcels. And we just wanna make sure that the bike lanes are going to maintain, be, be free and not be, um, there won't be any imposition or any um, conflicts on trash day with the bike lanes. Uh, in regard to DPW and stormwater and geotech, the applicant is still working on uh, taking DPWs recommendations or asks for more data. Um, so we haven't had a, a follow-up meeting with DPW, uh, but we are keeping track of that. And I think those were the, the main things that, um, that we were tracking. Um, so I think at this point, we'll just turn it over to uh, traffic. That would be George Lucas, who's the peer reviewer from Environmental Partners Group, who will give um, the overview of the peer review report. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, my name is Greg Lucas. I'm a traffic engineer and a uh, senior project manager with Environmental Partners. We conducted the traffic peer review of the project of the uh, transportation impact study that was prepared by Stantec. And what we had had some previous communication about the site um, with regards to the trip generation 
that they were using to determine the trips generated by the site. Uh, they prepared a trip generation memorandum summarizing using an empirical data approach. And what that means is that instead of using the trip generation calculations, um, the trip generation, generation data compiled by the Institute of Transportation Engineers, which is a typical process in our industry. Instead, because this is an expansion of an existing use, essentially an expansion of a facility that already exists on Center Street, instead we look at the existing data, we look at what trips that generates, we think about the ratio of the new um, units compared to the existing units and what that means for new trips based on those ratios. And so um, that is what Stantec, that's the process that Stantec followed in their trip generation memorandum and came up with um, four new trips in the weekday morning peak hour, uh, two entering, two exiting, and six new trips in the weekday evening peak hour. And so they look at their study area, which is you know the block formed by um, by Center Street, uh, William Street, Fuller Street, and Harvard Street. Looked at the intersections that form that block, as well as the intersection of Site Drive. Applied those trips, and as as you might expect, that's not a lot of new trips, and it doesn't have a material impact on the um, existing operations of those intersections. Um, we did dive a little deeper into their study and raise some questions related to data. Um, data was collected in September of 2021, and our industry has been paying close attention to traffic, traffic data trends and specifically the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so there wasn't any consideration of that. And in this case, there was historical data at one of the intersections. And so there was an opportunity there to kind of delve a little deeper and think about um, what that impact of COVID might be and whether it's appropriate to apply a factor to the September 21, 2021 data, um, which in turn would impact the analysis results, the volumes, the things that were summarized in the study. And so that was one of our um, critical comments. We also had looked at um, the crash data that was collected and there was some um, commentary on having a follow-up with Brookline PD that hasn't happened yet. There was talk about preparing a memorandum. So that's still an outstanding issue, something that we'd like to review when it is available. Um, there were some questions regarding factors that were used in calculating um, crash rates. And so um, that was one of our comments. And then additionally, when we get into the operational data, the capacity analysis that was summarized in the study, um, we had some questions regarding some of the uh, reporting that they used, some of the factors and things that went into that analysis. So kind of getting into the nuts and bolts of that analysis, but some questions of things that needed clarification. Um, the review of the um, mitigation of transportation demand management, we had no comments on that on what was proposed for TDM uh, made sense for the site and for um, what the expansion of the site will mean for the area. Um, if with regards to bicycle use, there was a bicycle, um, on-site bicycle storage provided, we recommended a bicycle rack, rack at street level uh, so that it could accommodate um, additional visitors via bicycle, uh, visitors or staff that may uh, travel via bicycle given the robust um, bicycle network that exists in the area. And that in general concludes our report. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Board members, any questions for our peer reviewer? Jesse? Uh, you don't question even even assuming supplemental data as you've requested, you don't question the conclusion that um, this project as proposed will materially increase traffic, correct? Could you restate that? I just wanna make sure I'm- Sure. You don't, think you don't think that this project, the conclusion that this project will not materially increase traffic is one with which you agree. I would agree with that conclusion. It's a minimal, it's a minimal number of new trips. 
Thank you. That's all I wanted. I, I should also add that responses have been received from Stantec that address a lot of these comments, um, that, that address each of these comments that provide supplemental information and a revised report. We haven't had a chance to review that yet, but it has been prepared and has been received. Thank you, sir. Randolph. Uh, no questions. Thank you, Mark. Okay, and, and um, I have nothing to add to uh, Jesse's question. It's fine with your conclusion, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, does the, uh, the applicant want to respond to uh, the peer reviewer's uh, uh, response? Um, hi, Jennifer DePazzo Gilbert for the applicant. Um, I would like um, George Ryan from Stantec just to briefly go over the supplemental information that was provided um, briefly before we move on to parking. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Mr. Ryan. All right, thank you, <clears throat> Jennifer. And members of the board, George Ryan with Stantec for the record. Um, as, as Greg had mentioned, we had you know, responded to to the peer review request for some additional data sources, um, you know, COVID nineteen adjustments, um, and and a lot of it was just kind of supplemental backup for the traffic and and um, parking analysis that was done, um, including some sinker reports and and other backup data, kind of <clears throat> really verifying what the what the um, results of the uh, the intersection analysis were. So be be happy to go into into detail with that if if we wanted to uh, I would ask kind of Rick to chime in um, but I think um, a lot of what Greg had requested was was like I guess said kind of backup data and, and we were happy to provide it. What what we'll do, Mark, um, is just because uh, we were uh, glad to get the their response um, to the traffic peer review so quickly, but obviously the peer reviewer does need some time to look at that. So we'll just make sure that we just get a follow-up memo um, from, from environmental partners on the supplemental information that the applicant provided, if that's okay with you. Okay, and uh, we can make it a, um, a matter for the next meeting that we'll review uh, the overall uh, the submission of data and uh, maybe just yet, Maria will get your conclusion as to whether it was adequate uh, for the request. Okay, uh, Maria, next on the agenda. Yep, we will have a Greg Strange Ways from Walker uh, Parking Consultants. They're our parking um, peer review. Thanks, Maria. Hi, everyone. Uh, as she said, Greg Strange Ways from Walker Consultants. We did the parking review, uh, parking peer review. Um, so the, the applicant and their consultant, Stantec, uh, you know, submitted some vehicle occupancy observations. Uh, we did, you know, request um, some additional observations and an expanded study area. Uh, and they, uh, Stantec did complete those and submitted those. And that's what we commented on. I think, as everyone knows, um, no new parking is proposed. So we don't have any comments on parking design. It, it's really all about parking supply and demand um, for, for the available parking in the immediate area. Um, you know, Walker did our own observations both during the weekday midday, which uh, you know, appears to be the peak occupancy time and then also some late evening observations as Stantec had done and basically confirmed that the observations appear accurate. Um, Stantec came up with 62 available parking spaces in the immediate area that could absorb the new demand from this project at, at 108 Center. Um, you know, we came up with similar observations and also just from their own data, I think the real number there was 55 usable spaces, so a little bit less than they showed because some of the spaces were restricted in various ways, but still 55 available spaces in the area. And then similarly, uh, Stantec took the vehicle occupancy observations and combined that with visitor logs um, and calculated the demand from the existing buildings at 100 Center and 112 Center. Um, and all that seems reasonable again, that uh, based on that, they calculated you know, 0 0.31 vehicles per unit total uh, for residents, staff, and any visitors, uh, caretakers caregivers. So 
um, all of that, you know, seemed reasonable and they calculated then that the project would generate 17 new vehicles parking in the area because uh, for the new building, no one would get on-site parking, including residents, staff, visitors, uh, everyone would be directed to park in public parking in the immediate area. Uh, so that calculation seemed reasonable again. We did note that the new building, you know, because it's new may attract younger residents and might have slightly higher parking demand. Uh, but overall, um, you know, if, uh, even if it generates a little more than 17 vehicles and there is only 55 available, uh, you know, we agree with the, the overall conclusion that there is available parking in the immediate area to absorb um, the new demand. Um, all that being said, you know, it's just worth noting, even if it seems obvious, um, you know, that zoning requires parking uh, so that people aren't, you know, using up the shared parking in the area. Um, that this project will generate some new demand, you know, uh, as calculated at least 17 spaces uh, and is not providing any new supply. So it's, you know, up to the town to determine whether that's acceptable. But overall, we, we agree that there is, you know, available parking in the area to absorb this demand. So Mr. Strangeway, just to clarify, so you're satisfied that this project will not uh, overly burden the existing supply of parking and that uh, you feel uh, reasonably confident that the local residents that require parking both on street and off street will not be uh, prevented from using their existing uh, supply of parking? Right, based on this project, you know, there's enough available parking, there still would be available parking even at peak occupancy times uh, in the area. Obviously this would reduce the available supply, but uh, not, uh, you know, create a situation where there is no available parking. Thank you, sir. Uh, board members, any other questions for the peer reviewer? Randolph? Yeah, just a question about the, the available parking supply. In, in, in identifying those available spaces, what, what's the balance of, of considerations on your part as to in, in including, you know, how close does it have to be or how public does it have to be? To be counted as available, you know, as you say, as a public lot versus a private lot. Yeah, just to take the second question first, I think you know both the applicant and we, you know, agree that it should be available to anyone. You know, so we did not include, um, you know, ADA accessible spaces, fifteen-minute restrictions, things like that. That it was available for at least, uh, you know, I think all of them were available for at least four-hour maximum. So that again, a lot of, you know, it would be usable by. Uh, you know, many visitors and and uh, and possibly some staff. Um, and then we actually worked with the town staff to you know agree on the study area, uh, which included you know two off street lots, Center Street and Fuller, and then on street parking. Uh, you know, basically in in the immediate area, so within a block or you know five minute walk. So it, it, it sounds, and I, I apologize if this was a paragraph in your report, but it, it sounds like a focus on, on short-term parking availability rather than, for example, the availability of, of um, you know, parking to rent and to, you know, to 24 hours a day, whether in a public lot or in a private lot for residents who, you know, have a car and keep it and need to park it somewhere. Um, and, you know, that's, that's um, certainly an issue in Coolidge Corner generally. Right. Yeah, so we did not look at uh, exactly how many would be expected to need 24 hour parking and how many of those are available, but some of the available spaces were, you know, unlimited, uh, you know, there are there is some on street parking that's uh, not uh, restricted in any way. Um, and then, you know, the, the residents who need 24 hour parking, you know, it's, it's much smaller than the 17, uh, I think it was projected at two or three or something like that. So we did note in the report that um, the overnight parking may be, we don't, we don't know whether there's waiting lists to get overnight parking and on site there is plenty of available space. Uh, so it may be something the applicant would wanna consider is to offer overnight parking to residents who need just that. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. No questions, Mark. Thank you. Um, Maria. 
Back yeah. to you. Okay, so we've, um, I, don't, I don't think that, I'm not sure if, if Jennifer has a response. Um, it's, it sounds like there's really um, no back and forth regarding parking unless the applicant has anything further to say uh, about parking. And no, if there are, if there are no further questions, I think um, parking's been been wrapped up. Maria, if you're ready um, to move into our uh, revisions and presentation on, on on what we were able to achieve in the working group sessions, I'd just like to make a brief comment. If you're ready, sure, we're we're ready to turn to the applicant's response to the design. Okay, great. I, I just want to thank Maria and Cliff um, for their um, time, their commitment, and their extensive feedback and guidance through the four working group sessions that we have. Um, I, I totally agree with Maria that the team worked really, really hard to turn around what they could and go through various iterations, but more importantly, to do the studies um, and the work as to why we could or could not accommodate um, some of the requests um, that both Maria and Cliff made and that were part of the ZBA charge. One of the things that we did focus on, and I think um, successfully, was to look at the campus and to look at the open space that was accessible to all res residents and will be accessible. And you'll see that in a moment in, in the presentation. Um, also, a um, uh, quick update. In the interim, we've been to the Housing Advisory Board and to the Select Board um, uh, twice and I'm pleased to uh, acknowledge that the town has committed $3.3 million um, to this project. It is, um, you know, as you, as you know, I just want to reiterate, 100% affordable. And um, th these folks, this is um, housing that is in very, very high demand. I know that from working, and, the, and Maria knows that uh, from working on the Two Life Project how many people uh, were on the waiting list for this, this type of senior um, housing. So again, thank you. Um, this evening, I just wanna mention that uh, one or two of the folks from Stan Tech might be jumping off to go to the transportation board because the transportation board is taking this project up this evening at the same time they usually meet on Mondays. They're now gonna be meeting on Wednesdays. So we did have that conflict, but we'll have folks staying on here and a couple of the necessary folks jumping over to that meeting later. Um, we did get a, a staff report and um, two of the concerns raised by the staff are gonna be addressed in this presentation. We, the team was literally working on this all day and all afternoon. Uh, so there's even more changes to address a couple of the things that were raised by Todd Corain in his staff report. And that had to do with safety for pedestrians and bicyclists on, on the uh, where trash and recycling is being stored. And we were able to uh, redesign that and address that. And you'll see that um, um, in a moment. And also there was a request to consider uh, by Cliff Bomer actually to cons consider some parallel parking on the side of the building. And you'll see uh, what, what, what we're contemplating there as well as um, Todd Corain uh, made another comment that um, at a minimum there should be uh, some handicapped spaces dedicated uh, for if there are uh, disabled folks in this building, there should be consideration given for a couple of spaces um, um, on site for this project. We've also looked at that. So this all happened today and you're gonna see that in the presentation. Um, so I don't want this to be too, too long of a night for everybody. So I'm gonna turn it over to Janice Mamayak from ICON to go over the presentation. Thank you, thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Jennifer. So Janice Mamaya, principal at Icon Architecture. And I have Patricia Rizzo with me, who will be my slide driver. <laughs> so Patricia, if you can launch the presentation, that'd be great. I want to reiterate what Maria had indicated in her staff report about the very productive working sessions that we've had over the last month. It was intense, um, but I think we have gotten to a better place and um, appreciate all the feedback and input that we had received. So next slide. As noted by Jennifer, as well as Maria, the ZBA charge that we were given is to look at open space campus wide due to that lack of um, open space specifically on our 108 site. 
Um, additionally, the site choreography and understanding all those um, site operations and flow, um, those will both be walked through by Dylan um, Stevens of Santec, and then I'll go through building design, massing, articulation. So next slide and we'll queue up Dylan. Thank you, Janice. Uh, Dylan Stevens, I'm a landscape architect with Stantec. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, so as has been mentioned, I think uh, one of the things we're excited about is to really explain you know, how the HSL campus works today, some of the great open spaces that exist um, during our really productive um, meetings here we've had with Cliff and Maria. We've you know, taken a closer look at those and some opportunities to even enhance them and uh, really explain how the, the 108 project um, really solves a need and, and will help that network. So go ahead to the next slide. So again, the three kind of parcels that we've um, that exist there today with a lot of activity, the 100, uh, 100 Center Street, 112, and the Brookline Senior Center. And then go ahead to the next slide. The 108 site really is going to be this link between these, and we'll get into some of the circulation. But I think, again, it's solving a, a big need for the campus circulation. Go ahead to the next slide. So uh, on projects like this, particularly with senior communities, um, walking in the areas for walking, particularly walking loops, are something we, we always try to incorporate. Um, this is really what exists out there today. If you um, are out at the site, you see people using these sidewalks. There's about a third mile loop that they can do around the block just on the public sidewalk. And then a, an interior loop that has a little bit of a missing, uh, missing connection that we can get to. But along this are some of these outdoor spaces that exist today. And they're you know, small seating areas, um, an entry plaza at the 112 building. Um, and these are just spots for people to take a break along these walks, you know, observe, you know, other people on the street, see the activity. Um, at the rear of the 100 center building, we have um, some great little existing um, seating areas, walking paths, uh, a little pergola, and then a lawn area, which is maybe underutilized today, but I think we, um, in working again with Cliff and Maria, we've come up with some ideas for how to really activate that space. Go ahead to the next. Uh, and then there's an interior courtyard. So there's really a variety of spaces here. This is in, in the center of the 112 and 120 building, kind of a flexible open space, some photos of uh, events that the, the residents in the community have had there. Uh, and then our project. So again, that these loops that we've talked about and connectivity through the campus, that quarter mile loop that you can do through the 112, 120 building right now. And then there's really no connection from Center Street back to the senior center or to the uh, rear lawn open space that exists today. It's a, not a safe place for people to walk. And our, our building is going to provide this very important connection from Center Street back and several um, new outdoor spaces associated with the building. And again, along these loops. Uh, just zooming in a little bit closer, again, the, the connections to the senior center, you can see, you know, various entrances to the, um, to the ground floor of 108, some of that community space that ICON will touch on later, um, small seating area in the back, some uh, seating near the drop-off pickup and on center, and then across the back, a connection, a new, new walkway connection that um, is outside of any vehicular way. Right now, anyone walking from the senior center to the 100 uh, center building or over to William Street would need to cross that existing parking lot. Go ahead to the next slide. Uh, and then our, our rendered site plan of some of these spaces, you can see that new walkway connection at the back at uh, number three that um, navigates around the parking. Uh, number two is our lawn space, which right now has a little bit of a slope to it, maybe part of the reason that's underutilized. So a new walkway across that with some seating. Uh, we think we can regrade this, provide some planting to buffer the parking and provide a nice level area for residents uh, to use. And then one, again, there's uh, some pictures of that area, some nice outdoor seating, you know, with some landscaping improvements, a little cleanup. I think, again, it's a great, great outdoor space that's already um, well used by residents. Uh, the parking, uh, the five spaces that are to remain along the side of the 108 building, um, it was mentioned that, you know, 
Cliff brought up potentially going to uh, parallel spaces there. So this is just graphically showing uh, we could fit two parallel spaces uh, within those five uh, right now um, perpendicular spaces. Uh, so that would be a reduction or a need to relocate three spaces, but it would provide some additional space along the side of the 100 or 108 uh, building. Uh, tree preservation, if you want to just go to the next plan. So this is just highlighting uh, in red, the solid red are the existing trees um, that are out there today that we can, we think we can keep with the proposed project. Again, none of these are um, actually on the 108 site. There aren't any um, within the 108 property line, uh, but the moves that have been made with the building and the site circulation um, will allow for those to remain. There are four trees that need to be removed for the outdoor space at the rear and for a transformer location on the right. Um, these are all invasive Norway maples. Um, and then we're proposing uh, seven new trees and just a couple pictures of some of the species to, to really make a nice um, vegetated border there along the, the connection from Center Street. Trash and recycling, again, this is, uh, we've been corresponding back and forth with Todd Corain at the town. Uh, go to the next slide, we'll just show the, the latest uh, thinking in the plan for um, how we can improve. So here's the top is uh, trash pickup, which happens on Mondays between 8 a.m. and 9.15. Uh, so this is showing that the uh, two dumpsters that serve 100 Center Street will be brought out and placed at the back of curb. So those are kind of going to be in line with the tree pit, uh, leaving four feet clear for pedestrians. There's some photos just below it of uh, someone walking behind the dumpster placed at the back of curb. Uh, for 108, which will uh, utilize a trash enclosure that's along the driveway entrance uh, that goes below uh, 112 and 120. There are four dumpsters between 108, 112, and 120, which will all be queued up in that trash enclosure until the truck's there to pick those up. And then the second uh, trash pickup we have is Thursdays, again, 8 a.m. to 9.15. This is trash and recycling. Uh, for 100 center, the dumpsters and trash uh, bins, so we have up to 20 recycling receptacles. It'll all, again, be placed at that back of sidewalk or back of curb, leaving four feet clear um, for pedestrians to navigate, no impact to the bike lane. Uh, and then for 108, 112, and 120, again, the dumpsters will go in the trash enclosure that's uh, out near the street. Recycling barrels will go at back of curb, uh, which leaves five feet clear for pedestrians to navigate around. I think that's it. So I'll turn it back over to Janice. Thank you. Great, thank you. So, Talking about the building, um, Patricia, next slide. Um, as we talk about the context, I just wanna put the project and where we're at in the context of our project goals. Um, as has been noted, uh, one of the primary goals is to maximize the number of units and ultimately the residents that will benefit from this very service rich environment. Additionally, we want to maximize the sustainable fossil fuel free um, Features with a specific goal to be Passive House certified. We had our kickoff for that yesterday and we are moving in the right direction in meeting those goals. Um, additionally, create a vibrant central hub of the CCB campus. Uh, additionally, program the ground floor with supportive uses for that Greater Brookline Senior Center. And we'll look at that in a minute. Um, and ultimately utilize efficient construction techniques. So next slide, starting with the building footprint. There was a lot of discussion in our working sessions about compressing or carving back footprint. Um, ultimately, one of the goals what, or one of the outcomes was pulling back the cafe area. You could see in the blue as proposed, we had that one story extension of the cafe that created a zero lot line, had impact with that uh, one of the trees that we wanted to maintain and impacted the clear pathway that we were putting um, to the back. So that is illustrated in the right, in the yellow, where we've cut back um, that footprint. But any more than that is really diminishing the program for the seniors. Um, identified, we've got our, our zero setbacks are now nine foot three to the left and four foot seven to the back. 
Okay, let's. Um, the scale of the building was noted as appropriate for this site, and I think that was articulated in some of the um, comments that Maria made as well. Um, we were asked to look at the massing or articulation and asked to look at bigger moves um, of compressing the plan or reposi repositioning the building. Um, we, we did study the setback at the front and the uh, generous drive-through drop-off area that we have now. We studied cutting it back to one lane or not at all. And the benefits of that, I think, were uh, minimal compared to the benefits as designed and getting a lot of that off-street traffic um, inboard. Let's go to the next. Well, I wanted to show the progression of the design. So as uh, Maria had noted as well, the left was as submitted the more Victorian expression of the six-story high or seven-story high-rise. Um, and as you can see, the working sessions two and three have progressed that to a much simpler expression of um, color and massing. And if we go to the next slide where we've landed today. Um, again, uh, this is the view across Center Street. Overall, a much more cohesive expression of, of this fairly simple and humble building. Um, the corner bay or tower element remains at the co coincide. The recessed Juliet balconies provide daylight and natural ventilation at the corridors of the residential floors. But most of all, the focus has been on that pedestrian zone at grade. With this central inviting entry, it's situated at the crest of the open arms of the drive, welcoming the residents and visitors to the building. Uh, we've got this tall arched canopy, an expression that somewhat recalls the arch of the senior center um, that engages the community at its most public point um, of the property. This canopy expression continues to the left and creates a cover to this walkway that we've been talking about, extending the length of the, the left side of the building. Next slide. This is a view on the other side of, oh, from the other side of um, the Center Street from the Cohen, uh, accentuating again the corner bay tower element. Um, Again, a much more simplified expression of the upper floors. There is an existing tree. I've got a green kind of circle. Um, we've removed it just for the graphics so you can see the uh, uh, delineation of the, the design, but we are intending to keep that. Um, but you can also see at grade, the trash enclosure that's been talked about, that corral right up at the head of the ramp from the garage. Um, we are proposing rebuilding that and setting it back. Currently, it's right at the edge of the sidewalk, and we want to be able to have some greater sight lines for cars that are leaving the garage. Um, additionally, on the ground plane, there's white boxes. Those are representing transformer, the existing generator, and some existing equip equipment at the Cohen um, site. Again, these are off of our 108, but directly adjacent on um, the Cohen site. Next slide. So again, focusing in on this front entry and drop-off area um, that we work so closely with uh, Maria and the peer reviewer, we wanna make it safe and accessible to all. Uh, we've worked with paving that's accessible, um, zero curb uh, uh, barriers between the, the sidewalk and the drive lanes, uh, illuminated bollards along that drive and that's all part of our overall lighting plan that was submitted um, and, and shared with the committee uh, with building mounted lighting bollards and um, you'll see later uh, some pool lighting, but all very dark sky compliant, shedding light downward and not outward. Um, I wanna make a caveat to that though, because we are looking campus wide, we are looking at more than the 108 site. It is going on to the CCB campus as a whole. So next slide, this is expression of that um, lit campus, um, accentuating the front facade, that tall entry, taller um, than previously shown to, to engage that open transparent windows. Um, and then that covered uh, canopy creating a, a kind of glow at the ceiling level of that and redundant wayfinding elements. So whether it's the covered, um, the covered canopy, the paver, colored paver edging at the walkway, and the lit bollards um, emphasizing that. 
that direction to the back. Next slide just looks at those elements and plan. Um, we added the stop sign and the bike rack. Um, I think that was one of today's <laughs> most recent gestures. Um, but again, looking at the materiality of that drive lane to give some texture and color um, while keeping safety uh, always in mind. Next slide. As we continue our, our journey around the building, um, we are looking at the view from Dinesh. Um, you can see at the ground plane that that pathway with the very porous visible, visible uh, porosity into the communal spaces, the, the cafe, the meeting area and, and other program spaces. With the busy engaged ground level though, the building has very modest articulation at the resident floors above. Um, we think this was originally suggested by, by Cliff, and we think it makes a lot of sense. The interplay of these building planes and materials creates simple patterning um, and comfortably relate to the adjacent buildings. Um, and as Maria had mentioned, we acknowledge additional study that we can do to work with the patterning of those, those materialities. But I do want to note that this simple envelope is designed to meet the highest standards of passive house design with an airtight and thermally thick skin, very high performance triple glaze windows, and essentially creating a strong thermal a thermos for the residents within. We were asked to consider um, breaking up the massing with large scale articulation, um, dropping units, and potentially adding the eighth floor. Um, we studied this at great level. Um, we circulated a memo that walked through the pros and cons of some of those gestures um, and ultimately have landed on this, this proposed seven story building. Um, Patricia, if you can advance. That was just showing some of the setbacks, um, 44 feet to the adjacent Winchester apartments, 28, or is it? 26 to the CCB lot line, but the actual 108 lot line is four foot seven from the building. This was looking at some of the, um, in narrative, the issues that were studied by going up that from a seven story to an eighth story. Structurally, we already have a very small footprint. And by adding another floor, it just makes that slender, uh, structure needing to be designed much more stiff, stiffer. Um, the sight lines for the residents living in the adjacent buildings really aren't impacted um, greater when we go to the eighth floor, so marginal benefits on those third floor units. Um, shadow impacts, well, well, there are shadow, there are already shadow impacts with the seventh, um, incrementally uh, more with the eighth. Um, passive house design, elements, we won't, we're very conscious of meeting kind of the cold cooling loads and by adding another floor, we're increasing the surface to volume ratio um, and adding more angles um, and corners and transitions um, to breach that uh, building envelope. Code is another issue. Seven stories meets the mass definition of a high rise, um, but by going up another floor, we're then triggering the IBCs um, requirement for hard rise. So there's more systems for pressurization at stairs um, that incrementally all these things just add up. So they're, they're complex, um, they're, they're doable, but they all incrementally add to the last bullet. Um, through all of these different aspects, the construction cost of that additional floor is tracking at almost 10% more, 9.25% more um, than the base structure that we're looking at. So um, that was our seven story justification. Um, I wanna continue with our, our walk around the site. Um, this is taking the path to the rear patio and the network of accessible paths. That's really what this open space is about, connecting the senior center and Cohen and Dinesh. Um, the pathway that exists now will be reconstructed to a slope walkway, as you can see to the left. A new fence will be added at the adjacent um, Winchester Street properties. But ultimately this plaza is 
enhanced with outdoor seating, social gathering spaces directly next to the social gathering place inside of the cafe. Um, new plantings are introduced. Uh, we've also included a green screen. So the, the bay windows with the canopy, the bracketed canopies, then extend to a green screen up the building to add some interest to that facade and ultimately add to our cooling um, strategies. Next slide. Again, just a plan view of this area, um, articulating lot lines, um, the three uh, tables and chairs that can be accommodated there um, and the like. Okay, next slide. Continuing up this walkway, we get to um, the corner of the site where the senior center um, currently has a walkway. There's an inset photo in the upper upper right that shows what that condition is right now. So we'd be enhancing that path as, as Dylan had indicated, that's the missing link to connect all these properties. So there's the, the walkway to the right, there's the actual handicap ramp to the left that brings us down to the 108 entry and then stairs in between. Um, continuing the, the lighted uh, pathways and building mounted um, lighting as well. And then next slide. These are some of the views that we considered of the direct neighbors, our immediate neighbors. So in the lower left, um, view A is the a, a view from the balcony, third floor balcony of those Winchester properties directly behind um, Dinesh. Uh, great view to th the enhanced activities uh, on that ground plane. View B is the a stack of uh, balconies on the next building on Winchester Street. Um, again, with a view to the back facade, but uh, also enhanced by the new trees that are added there and uh, views to the, the patio down below. The upper two are views from our existing properties. Um, view C from Dinesh, the upper floors of Dinesh and view D, uh, from the Cohen, upper floors of the Cohen building. So again, simple massing, simple articulation um, and colors and materials that embody, um, that wrap the building as a whole. And then next slide, we'd like to give you a kind of movie, a visual um, tour around the building. So Patricia, if you can start that. There we go. So we'll we'll land here and um, turn it back over to Maria and the board. Thank you. Um, before you move forward, I have some questions. Um, and really the question has to do with what we expressed last time, which was the issue of open space. And uh, the fact that uh, you're developing the rear area as the only really uh, publicly open space, which borders the public sidewalk. As we went around the building just now, I noticed that there was an area to the right rear corner of the building that is open. I'm not sure what that's used for, or whether that could be expanded as more accessible and landscaped open space. And uh, Cliff, I might want your input as to uh, the use of the public sidewalk and maybe incorporating uh, the, the public space with the private space more effectively since the rear sidewalk is on a different level than the private space. So is that directed at Cliff? Yeah. More or less, yes. <laughs> Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. And uh, maybe, Mark, I, I, I don't want to dodge your question. I'm really not dodging it, but I, I did want to make a couple of comments. 
Uh, I think all of you, I think a couple of things are very different about this project and, and the engagement that staff and, and this peer reviewer has had. Uh, I think it's unprecedented to have four working groups over three weeks. And uh, I think that that's very meaningful. I think it speaks to the importance of the project. And as uh, somebody who has personally been involved in many 100% uh, affordable projects, the kind of deadlines that they're working to meet are, are real. They're uh, you know, missing uh, these deadlines for funding. Can, you can lose a whole year in a project. So I, I think uh, Maria, both Maria and I have been enthusiastically engaged in the design I won't say on the design team, but certainly the the uh, critical uh, analysis on a very rapid fire basis. And, and uh, literally, I think at the time in the amount of time that it took me to write my summary memo, there were probably a couple other materials submitted that I hadn't reviewed uh, because they were new. And I would point out that these uh, the images that we're seeing tonight, it's the first time I've seen them. So it, and they, they are very clearly an advancement in, uh, from where it was and, and a direct response to much of the feedback. Uh, the, the other part that is unusual, I think other than the pace and progress and the responsiveness of the team, which uh, has been kind of amazing, um, is, is the notion that Unlike most projects, I think we look at the site that the project sits on as having to be essentially uh, standing on its own. And there's very good reason that that goes that way. Uh, this is different. I think it's engaged us in this kind of campus-wide view of things. It is uh, you know, something, something on the order of 400 apartments uh, that among these uh, three different sites. So it's a significant number of people and visitors to these people uh, who really do need the open space. So I, th I think our, our approach in reviewing this was really, I don't wanna say battling through, but really working hard to establish what the fixed elements are and are they really beneficial, not only to this development, but but to the, to the campus as a whole. And the fixed elements are, in, in my opinion, really coming very close to working well. The, the uh, drop off on the front, we, we push them very hard on looking at different, different ways of achieving something similar. But, but overall, I think the feeling is that, and if you've spent much time on that street, you know that the street gets really blocked up by very mundane uh, functions that are essential uh, and have become more important, you know, most importantly, deliveries and very basic things uh, just are not working on that street. So I think adding that drop off, it didn't take long to become convinced that that really was beneficial for this building and, and for the neighborhood as a whole. Secondly, the, uh, the unit count, um, making these affordable deals work is really a struggle economically and losing units is really difficult uh, and can, it can really uh, kill a project. Very small percentage of loss can have a very bad impact on a project. So that uh, I take that as a, a really a legitimate uh, sort of fixed uh, fixed element. And then as importantly, I think the, the programming of the first floor uh, by creating much more usable space uh, that really complements the existing uh, amenities, essential amenities in, in the 112 uh, is important. So I think the, the what we push them to look at really are the conventional, uh, I think our conventional approach are really looking hard at mitigating uh, the impact of, of really coming very close 
to lot lines. So I think it it took a lot of study and and discussion. Uh, I think there may be agreement among everybody that there could be a better sculptural approach uh, to a building that sits on this space. But having said that, I think the the rigor of the of the studies, uh, Janice just went through uh, some really legitimate points about sustainability and and how that relates to massing. Uh, the, the, those are all and and cost of construction. So, in any case, I, I think I'm where where we are now. I, I appreciate at the very beginning of this that. Uh, really focusing on the, that overall site plan, the connectivity of existing green spaces, enhancement of the existing spaces, even though they're not on the project site, I think are what really make it a credible proposal. Uh, there are a number of things there. They were outlined in my memo. Some of them have changed already because I'm seeing new materials tonight. I would say that I strongly still uh, would like to push for uh, eliminating those five spaces that are encroaching. Uh, the, it's an encroachment of the 110 site or the 100 site onto the 108 site. Uh, that connection from, uh, uh, from Center Street back almost directly to the senior center is a is a really nice uh, gift, I think, to the community. So I'm really hoping that can be integrated. And I have some, and, and I think it's to your point, Mark, so sorry to take such a long way around, but I'm still thinking that the way I would push this project, if we have a fifth and a sixth and a seventh working session, is really continuing to work on the uh, demonstrating the, the utility and connectivity of the working spaces campus wide, so that it's really apparent that uh, that that's adequate for a campus of this scale. I would also encourage uh, in in this diagramming and the diagramming that this team has done has been really excellent in helping us understand why they get to where they get in in the images that we're seeing. But I, I would include, and when you look at this, the image that's on the screen, keeping in mind that virtually the entire left-hand side of this building is space. It's programmable space, usable by all the residents of the campus. And I think it really helps understand uh, you know, the balance between indoor program space that's dedicated to the community and the outdoor uh, space. Um, but anyway, that, that's kind of where we're at. We push them really hard on, as we do on, and I think all of you know that uh, we push them really hard on increasing the setbacks on their own site. But I, I respect where they landed on this. Uh, the, the new images we've seen tonight for how the treatment of the building facade, I think is, it, it certainly is the best it's been. Uh, I think the building was struggling with a way to relate to its neighbor, its neighboring buildings uh, to the left and the right and to the neighborhood as a whole. Uh, the most successful images from day one in the working sessions have actually been the ground view uh, perspectives. Uh, generally speaking, and I think you all know that in a mixed use building, what really draws your eye to the building is the activity on the entry level. And this, I think it's helpful to really think of this as a mixed use building. Uh, it, the type of engagement that it's trying to establish through that programming of the first floor is really the most important uh, aspect. From the, from the first floor up, it, it's, it's kind of just typical residential use, which is why we continue to push them on accentuating first floor uh, engagement and, and back off a bit on the upper levels. Uh, <laughs> and I think they've done that. It's, it, they've really run through a lot of different options. And this is the first time I've seen this one and I think it's in the right direction. 
I think for those of you who worked on the, uh, you and the panel who worked on the two life development, I think we, th this is doing the same thing for me that that one did, which was really, really making a point of, okay, it, the two life, it's, it's only a six story building, but at the time that was one of the bigger buildings on Harvard Street. But I think they justified, uh, properly justified that kind of scale through a very strong engagement at the, at the entry level. And I think that's the way this project is moving. Uh, I really would continue to push them on making a convincing case that all of those open spaces are well connected and, and uh, well programmed in a way that complement each other uh, and are really functional and safe. I think the, the largest green space on the site is immediately adjacent to parking, two parking spaces with uh, cars aimed right at it. Uh, they have worked with a grade in that space. I think, uh, I think it could be easy to protect that space and make it work. Um, uh, and I, I apologize a little bit. You can probably tell, I think we've been successfully pulled in to really minute by minute analysis of this project. So, um, I think that's what I have to say at this moment. I, I, there, I think there's some other ways to keep pushing it in the direction it's going. Uh, but I think that, and I think it, including in my memo, I did, as I usually do, there's a kind of laundry list at the end of it of things that continue to, to stand out there. Some of them have been answered already. Actually, I think the developer yesterday or day before issued some answers to some of the questions. Um, and I don't think we hit on all those tonight, but it may not be necessary unless it's important to, to you folks to talk about it. Thank you, Cliff. I appreciate your input. Uh, board members, any further questions concerning uh, the current state of the design? Mark? Jesse? Um, I would like the applicant to go over what they're proposing as um, green usable space and just, so I understand it better, give me dimensions and um, when they were thinking about it, proposed uses and functionality. And it doesn't have to be precise, but I just, I wanna get a sense of what you were thinking of as you were looking at this, uh, you're calling it a loop with, with green spaces. Um, I wanna know how it actually functions in size. Yeah, so um, Dylan, do you wanna go over that? I, I don't know if you have the, the dimensions, but the approximate um, locations of all these areas what they could be used for programming wise, um, what they are used for now. I think you, one of them we showed a outdoor concert, um, but why don't you walk through that? Sure, so I have square footages of the new open space at the back of 108. Um, it's about 500 square feet. I think at its deepest dimension, it's about 10 feet um, where the wall kind of curves in. Several of those are uh, narrowed down to six or eight feet, um, but it's intended to again be flexible seating. There's, you know, a planter edge to soften between the walkway. Um, many of these spaces that we showed you are seating areas, and that's typically, honestly, for a walking loop again in a in a senior senior housing or a senior development. Um, those are some of the most used spaces. So. The lawn space and the interior courtyard um, at 112, 120 are I think two unique spaces to this campus. So the interior courtyard um, at 112, 120, I apologize, I don't have that square footage uh, written down, but again, that is, uh, there are tables, there's chairs, it's to have a, a flat level open space like this in a senior housing development is very valuable because it can be used for, um, gatherings for big groups, concerts, things like that. So we're not trying to necessarily over-program this space, but it, it's an existing large level area that's usable. Um, the lawn space, so this is, 
it's roughly 20 feet wide between the sidewalk and the existing parking. So this is where it was mentioned, the parking comes right up to it, but there's several feet of grade change across the lawn. So we're gonna put that grade change in the first five or six feet and plant it. And you can start to see that a little bit in the image at the top right. And again, we're, by adding the connection to the senior center, to the new development, people will be passing this lawn area more frequently. Um, it'll be more easily accessible. And again, we're not proposing other than seating along the walkway so people can sit next to the green space. We're not proposing it to really be programmed, but again, lawn space in a community like this that's level, a lot of times gets used for group fitness classes. Um, we're showing some people in chairs. I think some movable seating during nice weather would be a good use of this. And we even talked with HSL about having a space for uh, informal kind of lawn games, um, whether it's bocce or um, whatever other things um, groups would like to play, which a lot of times in um, communities like this, you see uh, done in public parks because that's the only space large enough to accommodate that. Um, the picture on the lower left, again, this is, we're still talking kind of walking loops and seating, but this is a, a shady area. Um, there's a pergola, there's a small water feature. Um, it just gives a variety of, of um, I guess, uses and types of settings um, for people to, to congregate. So um, hope that answers the question. If there's other spaces that you're curious about, I can go into more detail. The, the walking loop that is um, dependent on two sidewalks, one to the rear and one in the front, one in the front is a public sidewalk, correct? The one in the rear is a private sidewalk. Correct. It's on, it's on the property site, correct? Correct. Okay. Okay. Do you have a sense of total number of seats you think these will accommodate? I don't have that number. Are, are you thinking of fixed seating or movable seating? Uh, both. So many of the streetscape areas have fixed seating benches, uh, primarily um, the outdoor spaces such as the courtyard at the back and the interior courtyard um, at the Cohen building. Um, those would primarily be movable seating. Okay. And the landscaping that we're seeing is it the intent that there will be submitted a formal landscaping plan that evidences the walking loop and usable areas um, in a formal way? Or is this just a possibility of what you might, what the applicant might do with it? No, I believe everything that we've touched on for the added connection for the walking loop, the improvements to the lawn area um, would all be incorporated into a formal landscape and planting plan. Okay. And the landscaping area that is, I guess the best way for me to describe it would be it's to the north of the parking spaces that Cliff does not like. So you see a line of, I guess it's four trees. Right, exactly. Yeah. Was there some consideration of incorporating that also with your outdoor space um, to the rear? Was that looked at? So given that that's kind of along the side of the building and the walkway, we thought that screening the parking area um, mm -hmm. was a better use of that landscape. Um, so with the seating at the back and the seating at the front, that's really more of a um, I think a screening and kind of a, a edge for that walkway connection. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, Randolph. Any questions, comments? Um, just a couple of questions, and uh, um, I apologize if this sounds like piling on, but uh, but I'm I'm going to continue with some of what Jesse was asking about. Um, on the on the side of the building with the five parking spaces, and but let me tell you why because I think it's 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 for 
it, it relates to some things that I really appreciated and thought were, were some of the most thoughtful and you know, progress-filled uh, sections of the proposal. Um, and we can stay with this drawing because I'll, I'll eventually get to the question about it. Um, the, I thought this, the, you know, the site planning, the site plan drawings and some of the, the three-dimensional drawings of outdoor space um, at the rear of the 108 building, for example, where the, where the cafe first floor areas had been trimmed back and you know, allowed whatever that, you know, some number of feet of additional outdoor space. I, I, think, I think the design team has made, um, has made a lot of that opportunity. I think it's, uh, there's been quite a lot of payoff in you know, developing a kind of usable, humane, you know, comfortable, elder appropriate outdoor space at the back of the building. I would even say the same about the front of the building just because the design has advanced and we can get a sense of what that's like on the street and how easy and comfortable it is to use. So in coming back to this, um, this uh, the walking path, uh, you know, it's part of, part of the loop that we heard about at the very beginning of the Landscape Architects presentation. Um, my question is, um, you know, and it relates a little bit to what Jesse was asking about. Um, you know, if 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 the tr if this the the cars were reconfigured in that area so that say the the there could be you know more space to walk, more tree screening, and and could could there be other things there? Is the is the notch and the the shallow setback in the building enough, or are the distances from the front to the back meaningful enough? to you know create some kind of other little node in there and you know like i said a minute ago i'm just i'm asking because you know you've you've done a lot with with you know moves in small spaces here and i just think this area has has great potential as as cliff does and that's why we're all talking about it sure and i think again this the way this sets up along the parking um it's sort of its own kind of streetscape typology, right, of a walkway with mm -hmm. vegetation. And um, while we don't have these trees and tree pits, I think there would be opportunities for, again, small pocket seating areas along there um, to get any sort of real large contiguous space um, for a large plaza or a, even a lawn area would be difficult in this strip. But I think it maybe lends itself to, again, some more seating um, along that connection. Do you, do you have a sense of how, how much more seating or just, you know, places for individual people to sit either on the 108 property or right along the edges of it are being provided for the whole block of buildings through the design that's currently proposed here? And so, maybe compared to what's existing, I don't know how much outdoor fixed seating there already is on the campus. Sure. So in areas labeled two with the lawn, um, that would all be new, new seating. So three fixed benches and then whatever maybe movable lawn furniture would be out there. Um, the seating area in the back, we have three movable tables um, with chairs and then we're proposing some built in bench seating into the planter wall along that edge. I think we have three benches uh, proposed to be built into that and then two benches um, at the front along the drop off um, would be all the new new seating that's proposed. Again, some of the other, like the area labeled one um, would just be really landscaping, landscape cleanups um, for the existing seating that already exists. Okay, thank you. Um, um, you know, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just end with a, with a comment. I, 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 you know, I, I know you've heard a lot of comments about you know, this particular, uh, you know, uh, up and down, whichever direction it is, you know, the front to back, um, you know, piece piece of open space. And I, I think the other reason that I'm focusing on it is that I think in other areas of the design, um, the the focus on the ex the experience of outdoor space at ground level, uh, and the way that the first floor areas of the building are approached, um, is really paying off. There's clearly a lot of good work done there in the in the in the working groups, um, and I, I hope that thinking will will you know lead to lead to more examination of that side of the building. So, thank you. Thank you, Randolph. Maria, back to you. 
Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, I think it, at this point, um, we can take some questions from the public. I, I believe there were, um, I think three people who had raised their hands or indicated that they might wanna say something. Um, so if it's okay with you, we'll turn it over to public comment. Uh, yes, uh, and, and again, I remind people that uh, they should confine their comments to the matters that are presented this evening. There'll be further opportunities later on. Okay, I believe Ruth Glazer um, wants to speak. So I'm gonna promote Ruth. And if she doesn't, if she's changed her mind, she can just let me know and I'll, I'll make her an attendee again. So I'm gonna promote Ruth Glazer. We have a lot of people here, so I'm... Okay, Ruth, you've been promoted if you'd like to speak. Um, you can unmute and share your video if you'd like. Okay, I'm not sure. Ruth, do you want to speak? Yes. Okay, Ruth, we can hear you. Okay. Well, you know, I've been listening to this since seven o'clock and the main issue that I keep hearing is open space, open space for residents to use. And as a resident, I, I live at 112. And as a resident of 112, I will tell you, um, I've been here 13 years and I do not see the residents being inclined to using open space. They, they may, uh, there's a small group of people who utilize the benches, which are adequate, in the courtyard, which is really nice if you like to have a, a little get together with your friends. Um, but the senior population is, is not into just gathering together and doing things in, in big open spaces. So to me, it's not a tremendous issue. I think that the availability of benches is wonderful. The availability of the courtyard for all three buildings is also wonderful. We, you know, I myself find that to be a, a very good place to, you know, sit with friends maybe and have a cup of coffee but it's definitely underutilized. Not many of the residents participate in outdoor space. And um, that's the point I want to make for you. And I'm certainly in favor of this building because I, I, I think that there are a lot of people out there, seniors who would um, benefit from living in this type of affordable housing on Center Street, which is quite beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you. I'm next going to promote uh, Rosalie Weiner. Uh, Rosalie. Okay, Rosalie. Hello. Yes, Hi. we can hear you. Hi, thank you so much for listening to me. I am a resident of 112. I have been here six years. I am grateful resident with the exemplary staff, I find that the opportunity to allow others to have an op to live in this neighborhood and live at 108 and experience the staff and the comfort of aging in place with the caring and loving that's given to each one of us is a most important. And I also believe that with the parking, most, there are many of these um, expensive condos that don't have parking and they seem to be able to find parking. They seem to exist either with public transportation and with the many amenities that are walkable. And I myself, I do still drive. However, I have found I have walked more than ever since I've lived here than when I lived more suburban. And I'm just very pro um, this development and, and adding to this community that is so vibrant and wonderful and staffed so elegantly. Thank you. Thank you, Rosalie. Um, I'm next going to promote Carter uh, Jaffe. Let's see where he might be. Still looking for him. Oh, Carter, you've been promoted. Sorry about that. 
you can you can unmute if you'd like. Okay. Okay, we can hear you, Carter. Yeah. Um, how much time do I have, by the way? Um, <laughs> well, how long were you were you thinking of speaking? <laughs> let's put it that way. <laughs> eight, eight or nine minutes. Oh boy. <laughs> well, let's start with three. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, I, I just want, okay, I, I'm in my 11th year here, and for a half a dozen years, I was the default guy, the guy that ran the food programs, uh, that wanted all the flowers for six months that they didn't take out. They, they have taken out my flowers. Now it's, they got some portable planters. We had this heavy equipment is, so the two ladies that spoke, I like them both, but they are far away from the construction. We have uh, maybe 26 feet or 25 feet that is available. And I need to walk the property with another hundred people that are against this in three or four or five of you, because you've been read, literally down the, you know, the primrose way. I love Rhonda and this thing, is going to generate a bigger liability for the town than your firemen did. Now you have, within a hundred yards of us, you have a school that was tripled in size. You have a synagogue that was tripled in size. You have four new apartment buildings at Harvard and Fuller, at Williams and Fuller, the one that's on the other side of the fence from 100's parking lot. And you have the one at the corner of, uh, Center Street in Fuller, which is like 15 feet from the, uh, the townhouses. Now, everything about the drawings is distorted. And we have a heat island here. Open spaces are a joke. They even took away the grassy area. We had a corner of grass at Fuller and Center. They took it out. They had a little apron of grass in front of all three buildings. We're the only one that lost our grass. A neighbor complained about how ugly that house was a couple of years back. So uh, they put grass in front of it and painted in front and the other three sides still look just as ugly and shabby, but they are submitting to you a, a, like a glorious oversized plan that won't fit there and has no business, you know, making our neighborhood, uh, what do you call it, uh, denser. Because there's no parking now, and all of these nice pictures are just that, the pictures. There is no space to put, and anything, the ornaments that were hung on here, is trick-or-treat items, if you ask me, a connection with the senior center, it's 10 feet away from us. And how can you mix a public building with a private building? And then they're talking about another ornament was, we'll put a cafe and open it to the public inside our ground floor. Well, the senior center sometimes only gets a few people for their events. Very few will show up to ours. And this is before the construction on our building and before this plan. We get five or six or seven people if we're lucky for any event, even though it's a schedule's made every week of, events and classes and this and that. So I say to you, I want to give a tour to a number of you that are decision makers and walk the property. And the third and most, you know, depressing thing I have to share with it about, I was going to live here until I die, is that this building with all of the plans and drawings and things you went to, for this alleged $38 million modernization or upgrade, it turned out the opposite of that. The other two buildings have nice carpeted halls and wood baseboards. And our building, they had to, they wanted to put all of the electricity on a single house account. So every single apartment got shorter, got smaller. They had to take large pieces of the apartment inside. Mr. Jaffe, it's, it's been about four minutes. So if you could just combine well, your, your comments this, to, the, to this project or and, and the topics at hand, um, I thought wouldn't be helpful to, to the it's ZBA. It's related. You're trying to get so close to our building in a project that you previously approved that was botched. And the same characters 
at HSL, with maybe a new architect now, doing all the computer work, even insulted you by bringing in the 12 story building. And now they're doing a seven that in their depictions of, of where things are and how they are, I'd say that's 80% wrong. So I please say, come out here with your cameras and talk to some residents that are scared to death that Brookline is not gonna get it. Okay, Th thank you, sir. So is, what, what am I, what, what, you just leave people ha hanging or will some of the people speak back to me and accept the invitation? Uh, we'll, we'll leave it up to the, the board. They've already have gone on a, on a site visit, um, sir. And we, we're just going to see if we have any more people who want to, want to speak. This is the public comment period. Okay. Thank you for your comments, sir. And uh, we do listen to what you have to say. And uh, as a suggestion to uh, anybody who uh, feels the same way, uh, they're welcome to participate and come to the next meeting and express their opinions as well. So thank you very much. Uh, Maria, next item on the agenda. Okay, I don't think we have any more, um, any more speakers, anyone who wishes to speak. Uh, so at this point, um, it, would, it would really be up to the ZBA if you have any further questions or if you have further instruction and direction uh, for the project team. Okay, thank you, Maria. Um, from my point of view, I, I see the peer reviewing uh, groups and the peer, uh, the, uh, the meetings going in a positive direction. And I would encourage uh, uh, both sides to continue to work together. I think that the, uh, the expressed uh, charges that we have given you, um, you've taken seriously to this point. And uh, we reiterate that we are uh, uh, encouraging you to make further progress along those lines. And that's all I have to say, but Jesse, you're welcome to join in. I, I agree with um, your general comments. Um, I agree in particular that um, um, look, I think, I think that Many of the board's charges, um, I'm appreciative that the applicant looked at them, but essentially the applicant saying no. So um, with respect to uh, open space, while I hear what um, a member of the public stated, it, it's inconceivable to me um, with no park in the area, um, simply ignoring the importance of there being available outdoor space that is functional. Um, I appreciate that the applicant has started to look at that. I appreciate what the applicant has done. I think it bears further consideration. Um, I'm not sure what you've presented um, is functional um, I'm keeping an open mind, but I think a lot of what you've done is simply take existing public and some existing private space and um, pretty it up. Um, and I wonder if there are other ways that you can supplement what you've provided. Um, I, I, I'm well aware of the importance of um, what it is you're trying to achieve here, which is to maximize the number of units to keep in mind cost. I mean, I mean the reason you don't want to add a floor is because it significantly adds cost. Um, but at the same time, I am serious about taking into consideration um, what I think are important aspects for the people who are actually going to live in that building and who are neighbors. It wasn't actually the ZBA that first raised this concept of a concept uh, of a campus. It was actually the applicant. A campus requires a, co a coherent um, outdoor area. 
And while I hear that these are people who maybe are, don't need a um, soccer field, I do like your idea about a loop. The, the question is, are there other areas that you can add to this to um, support it? So that's my comment. Thank you, Jesse. Randolph. Um, without any, any further commentary, I, I will say I, I share Jesse's um, view of the importance of open space. Um, and I've commented about that already. Uh, just a couple of other things. I, I do appreciate the, the height study and the, the comparison of you know, podium construction systems to steel. Um, and you know, appreciate your going on the record about the construction costs of that. Um, uh, with respect to the exterior design, you know, th th that um, uh, just a remark that uh, I think that the, this is an area where the working groups have, um, you know, achieve what looks like good progress to me. And I think one of the ways that, um, that that's playing out is, and I was talking about this, uh, you know, in my last remarks, this, um, you know, this, this focus on the experience of the building at the ground level as you go in and out of it on the outdoor space um, is, is, a, is a good focus. And it actually is a, is, a, is a good way to separate, you know, the design of that part of the building from the superstructure, from the stories above the first floor. I actually think that the building as you're proposing it now, uh, you know, as a, as a better tall building, you know, mate to its buildings to the right and to the left. Um, and I would, you know, happily see, um, you know, more of your design attention focused on that ground level experience, you know, as the design moves forward. Thank you, Randolph. Back to you, Maria. Okay, so uh, what we have confirmed is November 3rd, that's just two weeks from now. Um, and I'm also uh, looking at other dates, uh, November 22nd, December 13, and December 27. Um, just, want, just want to get commitments from the ZBA for those three other dates. And I just want to ask the project team, so my understanding is that we really have to focus more on that ground plane and we have two, two more weeks. Does that seem like a, a good time frame for going back to the ZBA um, with probably one working group and some phone calls and emails um, to present you know, some, some ideas? I mean, I, I'm thinking the options for enhancing that, that ground floor space are really going to be probably a solution with the parking or either moving the building north. That, that's all I... We look, we, we look forward to continuing that discussion and with the focus and direction that we were given by the ZBA and our biggest goal, um, not that it's the ZBA's concern, but it's certainly the project team's concern um, uh, to stick to that January schedule that you set, Maria, and we were really, really pleased to hear that you think we can meet that. And so getting um, some more dates on the books is, is, our, is um, would be huge for the team. Okay, then we will prepare to have a response to this latest ZBA charge on November 3rd uh, at 7 p.m. And I just like to hear from the ZBA if, if we can confirm November 22nd, December 13th, and December 27th. I'm not gonna confirm that at this point. I'll confirm the third and the 22nd. Okay. And uh, I can confirm the third, the 22nd, and the 13th, I'm gonna withhold uh, on the 27th. Maria, same, same for me as Mark just said. Okay, all right. All right, so I, I believe we've covered uh, all the bases for this evening. I wanna thank everyone for participating and coming and uh, this meeting will, will close and we will reopen on the third as uh, we discussed. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank you. Thank you Stay all for your time. All of you. Have a good evening. Uh, you you too. Thank you. Bye-bye.